Our next speaker is Maryam Namazi. Maryam is a campaigner, commentator, and broadcaster. She's a spokesperson for Equal Rights Now, the organization against women's discrimination in Iran, the One Law for All campaign against Sharia law in Britain, and the Council of ex muslims in Britain, which recently celebrated their fifth anniversary. She works closely with the Iran Solidarity, which she founded, and the International Committee Against Stoning on the Sakina Mohammadi Ashtani case, and that of others. Moreover, Maryam is Central Committee member of the Worker Communist Party of Iran, a National Secular Society Honorary Associate, and the NSS 2005 Secularist of the Year Award winner. She's an emeritus member of the Secular Humanist League of Brazil. Her blog has been rated one of the top 100 atheist blogs, and she was selected one of the top 45 women of the year 2007 by Elle Magazine, Quebec. Please help me to welcome Miriam Namazi. Hello, everyone. It's a wonderful pleasure to be here. My parents are here with me, and I thought, this is not the right conference to bring your parents to. It was a very uneasy morning, let me tell you. <laughs> I'm going to be speaking about Sharia law, the veil, and sex apartheid today. Sometimes I really don't know what more there is to say. What else can I say about Sharia law, the veil, and sex apartheid? that at least in your gut, you don't already know. Feminine activists protesting Islamic states at the London Olympics just this past Thursday said it very well, no Sharia. They were arrested by the British police in a manner befitting the Islamic morality police merely for speaking a truth, that Islamism kills a generation. People like Maria Mayubi, mother of two, who was taken to her stoning on a stretcher because she fainted when she realized she was being sentenced. Or like the young teenagers stoned in Iraq for their haircuts and tight jeans. Or like Najiba, the young woman in Afghanistan, recently shot dead by the Taliban shouting Allah ordered her killing. Or like Sweet 16 Atif Rajabi, hung from an Iranian city square for acts incompatible with chastity. We must never forget them. For they were someone's north, south, east and west. And many a beloved, like W.H. Auden, wished the clocks would be stopped and pianos silenced when they were killed. Legally, I might add, under Sharia's system of injustice. Of course, apologists for Sharia courts in Britain will say that it is people's right to religion. Absurd. Yes, the criminal aspects of Sharia law aren't being implemented in Britain. Only civil aspects are. Divorce, child custody, marriage, domestic violence. You know, the mundane matters, the private matters. Have you noticed how when it comes to denying women's rights in the family, Sharia courts suddenly become people's right to religion? Under its rules in Britain, no different from a court in Iran or Afghanistan, a woman's testimony is worth half that of a man's. A woman can't sign her own marriage contract. Men have unilateral right to divorce, whereas women have limited rights to divorce. Child custody goes to the father at a preset age, irrespective of the welfare of the child. Girls get half the inheritance of boys, and so on. The British Islamic Sharia Council, a charity no less, the Council of Ex-Muslims was denied charitable status because it um, promotes secularism and because it doesn't want religion to have a privileged position in society. But Islamic Sharia Council, which legislate misogyny day in and day out, are a charity. They explain why this has to be so with regards to women's testimony. It says if one forgets, the other can remind her. It's the difference between a man and a woman's brains. 
A woman's character is not so good for a case where testimony requires attention and concentration. And this also applies to divorce. Women are governed, they say, by emotion. Men by their minds, so they will think twice before uttering talaq or divorce. It goes on to say that this is not meant to be derogatory, but it's the secret of women's nature. A senior judge at the Islamic Sharia Council has said there's no such thing as marital rape. To call it rape is the actual act of aggression. And domestic violence is often seen as the prerogative of the husband, though in Britain, domestic violence is no longer a personal matter, but a criminal one. And they are even dealing with child marriages. In 2010, over 30 cases of child marriages were found in one borough, Islington. At least three of them were 11-year-old girls and two nine-year-olds who had been forced into marriage with older men. The oldest girl involved was 16 years old. Right to religion indeed. The same apologists will say the veil and sex apartheid are merely the right to dress and all of this is people's right to choose. I suppose it may be if the chastity belt was also a form of clothing and foot binding where women's feet were broken so that they didn't wander too far away from their male guardians, a form of shoe wear. The veil is a symbol like no other of what it means to be a woman under Islam, hidden from view, bound and gagged. It is a tool for restricting and suppressing women. It's a mobile prison, a body bag. As I have said before, take away all the pressure and intimidation and threats, and let's see how many women remain veiled. There will most likely be more women veiled in Britain than anywhere else because of its being hailed the right to dress. At Stop the War rallies, which I stopped going to, we were told to veil in solidarity with the women of Iraq. How romantic it is to cover women from head to toe because they are the source of chaos in the world. Before we go any further, I have a question to those who use human rights and anti-racist language to excuse and apologize for inequality, discrimination, violence against women, and barbarity. And this is it. Even if it were people's right. But as we know, no right is absolute. And even if they were real choices, let's put aside the threats and intimidations that are part and parcel of Islamism for one minute. What is your position on it? Do you have one? Do you think it's wrong? Would you like it for yourself and for those you love? If not, then please stop apologizing for it. Even if these were real choices and rights, which they are not, I and many like me will continue to fight against it. Years ago, it was a right that only men would have the right to vote. And it was perfectly legal to own slaves. Hiding behind rights and choice to defend misogyny is a betrayal of humanist principles and human solidarity. Remember good old-fashioned international solidarity? I really miss it, don't you? Where we actually join forces with those suffering under racial apartheid, for example. Nowadays, the liberals and postmodernist left, and I'm on the left myself, they side with those imposing apartheid, sex apartheid, because of course it is their right to religion. This solidarity though is especially important when Islamism and Sharia laws have killed a generation, when we are living under what I call an Islamic inquisition. It's the difference between Christianity today, and we know how bad that still is, to one during the Inquisition. Under an Inquisition, there is no personal right to religion. You are merely told what to say and do, and if you don't abide, you will pay the price for your dissent. The right to religion that keeps being thrown around is the right to a personal religion and belief. When it is part of the state, the judicial system, the educational system, it is no longer a question of personal belief, but of political power. And religion in political power is the end, is the end of any form of equality, choice, rights or freedoms, and democratic politics. <clears throat> when I hear the right to religion in the context of Sharia courts, the veil and sex apartheid, to me it means the right of parasitical imams 
and reactionary Islamic states and organizations to deem what is acceptable and what is not. There is an assumption in this defense of the right to religion that the authentic Muslim is reactionary and pro-Islamist, pro-Sharia courts, pro the veil, pro-sex apartheid. But this is Islamism's narrative. As Palestinian professor Musa Budeli has said, following threats by Islamists for cartoons he posted on his door, they choose to resort to abuse and threats of physical violence, attempting to appropriate to themselves the sole authority of what Muslims can and cannot think, can and cannot do. There are and will remain as many different Muslims as there are unfettered minds. Here's one of the cartoons he received death threats for. The man says, you look gorgeous today, dear. He's looking at the shower curtain. And she says, I'm here. Recently, a British court told a Muslim hospital consultant that he must pay his ex-wife maintenance, even though under Sharia, he said, he believed he owed her nothing. And this is, of course, because his wife, who's an ac academic, went to a British civil court, unlike so many women who don't have those choices and are forced to go to Sharia courts and lose their rights. Anyway, this poor old rich doctor Zaid al-Safar was so incensed that he had to share his assets with his wife, his ex-wife. He said in all these newspaper interviews that family law in Britain is biased against Muslim people. But isn't his wife Muslim too? Depending on how you look at it, I would say it is very favorable for Muslim women at least. Muslims are not a homogeneous community. When you give group rights to a community, you basically give further power to the imams and Islamic scholars at the expense of women and many others. Conflating Islamism and Sharia courts and its veil and sex apartheid with Muslim is part and parcel of the effort of their feigning representation. In fact, Islamism is part of the project for controlling the population at large and is not an exercise in people's rights and choices. To say as much is to hand over countless individuals, many of them dissenting, to the far-right Islamic movement and to ignore, to ignore the immense amount of resistance, social and civil struggles and class politics that's taking place. Here's a perfect example of the Egyptian revolution. People are shouting for education, bread, healthcare, prices, about poverty, unemployment, human rights, and housing, and you've got the Islamists standing there screaming, no bikini. This is not a question of identity. Muslims wanting Sharia against the rest of the world. It's about politics and whoever's choice you decide to side with, the Islamists or the women's. The same applies to using anti-racist language and deeming any criticism against Islam and Islamism as racism against Muslims. Here's an excellent Jesus and Mo cartoon. Um, it starts with Jesus saying, if we want to live together peacefully in a multicultural society, we must ensure that everyone's fundamental beliefs are protected from attack and ridicule. So someone in the audience says, I don't want my fundamental beliefs to be protected from attack or ridicule, thanks. Please feel free to attack or ridicule them anytime you wish. They think a little while and they go, Muhammad says, racist. <laughs> and, and again, this, this you know, the, the fact that this is framed in, in terms of racism and Islamophobia is particular to the West. If you're criticizing Islam or the veil or Sharia law or Islamism in Iran or Egypt or Afghanistan, you are not accused of racism. You are accused and sentenced for enmity against God, blasphemy. Um, you know, heresy, apostasy. So, for example, when the Saudi government arrests 23-year-old Hamza Kashgari for tweeting about Muhammad and also saying that women in Afghanistan, uh, sorry, women in Saudi Arabia can't go to hell because they're already living in hell as it is. They can't go twice. And he's facing a death sentence because of it. When they arrest him, they don't charge him with racism. They charge him with blasphemy and apostasy. But that same government when it deals with criticisms at the UN level, will charge those who criticize them, like you know, Roy Brown of the IHU, of, of being racist and Islamophobic. 
What I'm trying to say is that Islamists and their apologists have coined the term Islamophobia. It's a political term to scare monger people into silence by deeming it racist to criticize anything related with Islam or Islamism. These bogus accusations of Islamophobia and offense often serve Islamism in the same way that Sharia law serves them when they have power. It helps to threaten, intimidate, and silence criticism and defense, dissent. It is used to defend Islam and Islamism, not Muslims, not Muslims. Throughout human history, barbarity has been pushed back, not by making excuses for it, not by appeasing it, not by deafening silence, but by challenging it head on. It's no different today. Our era's progress is intrinsically linked to a criticism of Sharia law, the veil and sex apartheid, a political challenge to Islamism and an acknowledgement that there is an Islamic inquisition and that we need real solidarity with and a strengthening of the anti-Islamic enlightenment that is bubbling from below, you will find no greater opposition to Islamism than people from people living under Islamic laws. An anti-Islamic enlightenment that is that despises Islamism and Islamic morality, that scorns the mullahs. There was a recent uh, uh, interview of a mullah who couldn't get to parliament on time, and they told him, well, why are you late? And he said, no taxi would pick me up in my mullah garb. I had to go home and change into street clothes. That's the only way I could get a taxi. That scorn is real. The jokes against the mullahs in Iran, for example, is, an, is another, um, is evidence of this. Um, it, it, it's an anti-enlightenment, uh, anti-Islamic enlightenment that is against ordained social hierarchy. And what it doesn't need is more attempts at rescuing Islam and Islamism under the cover of human rights and anti-racism. Mm. A defense of secularism is also key, that, but I'm very much pro the French version, not the wishy-washy, oftentimes British version of it, where it's a strict separation of the state from the educational system, the judicial system, and the state. Um, but even so, I think that's not enough. Today, more than ever, I think we need to focus also on the dereligionization of society. Not religion as a private affair, but against the religion industry, which is above the law, unregulated, and never held accountable for its fatwas, murder, and mayhem. As the late Marxist, atheist, and humanist Mansur Hekmat said, I'm going to end with his quote, in Islam, the individual has no rights or dignity. In Islam, the woman is a slave. In Islam, the child is on par with animals. In Islam, free thinking is a sin deserving of punishment. Music is corrupt. Sex without permission and religious certification is the greatest of sins. This is the religion of death. In reality, all religions are such. But other religions, most of them, have been restrained by free thinking and freedom-loving humanity over hundreds of years. This one has never been restrained and controlled. With every move, it brings abominations and misery. Moreover, in my opinion, defending the existence of Islam under the guise of respect for people's beliefs is hypocritical and lacks credence. There are various beliefs among people. The question is not about respecting people's beliefs, but about which are worthy of respect. In any case, no matter what anyone says, everyone is choosing beliefs that are to their liking. Those who reject a criticism of Islam under the guise of respecting people's beliefs are only expressing their own moral and political preferences. Full stop. They choose Islam as a belief worthy of respect and package their own beliefs as the people's beliefs, only in order to provide populist legitimation, legitimization for their own choices. I will not respect any superstition or the suppression of rights, even if all the people of the world did so. Of course, I know it is a right for all to believe in whatever they want, but there is a fundamental difference between respecting the freedom of opinion of individuals and respecting the opinions they hold. We are not sitting in judgment of the world. We are players and participants in it. 
Each of us are party to this historical world class struggle, which in my opinion, from the beginning of time until now, has been over the freedom and equality of human beings. Thank you very much.